we minister based on the what if. Yeah. What if? Faith says, what if God does this? What if the Holy Spirit visits those 50 plus colleges and universities in Chicago? What if the international students who come and they get filled with the Holy Spirit meet Jesus, they go back to their nations and become missionaries to their nations? What if your high schools are set ablaze with the power of God? What if God moves in such a way this next week that's wow. going to wreck your lives? We have to live by the what if because that's what God does. And so with that in mind, please pray for us. Please pray that God will continue to build his kingdom through our ministry in the city of Chicago. And if you're interested um, in finding out more about what we do, um, I asked Pastor Andrew if this would be okay. We, we do have um, a um, sign-up sheet if you want to be on our newsletter mailing list. Just to keep you guys posted on how you can be praying for us, if that's okay. Um, Pastor Bob, we would love to keep people posted on what is happening. Amen. And so, speaking of what if, I want to get into the word. Uh, John chapter 9, we're going to come out of the, um, the book of John with the message this, uh, this morning. And again, I just want to thank, um, thank God for this opportunity uh, just to come here and connect. Um, and you all get it. If you, for those who are here, especially those you know, who are local, you understand the need to have 40,000 students right up the street, hallelujah, who, who need Jesus. We were on campus yesterday. Um, we went there for spiritual reasons. We went there to walk around and then we grab some ice cream. <laughs> you know, come on, it is, and we had to go and, and it was called Baby Scoop. Was that the name of the spot? Yeah. So Jesus is there in the midst of the ice cream, too. So we had a good time on campus. But you guys understand the need on these college campuses. But John chapter 9, we have it up on the screen. John 9, and uh, we're going to read the first seven verses. And you can look up on the screen. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while in his day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he stood on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go. Wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Amen. Amen. Let's pray um, and then we'll get we'll to the word. Thank you for your word, God. We thank you, Lord, that your word is alive and your word is changing lives and your word is truth. Yeah. And it's the rock that we can all stand on, Lord. And I pray for everyone here, God, including myself, God, that you would give us ears to hear what you desire to speak to us as a body. And God, I ask you now to open our hearts to receive your word implanted that is able to save and sanctify our souls. As I pray, won't you pray in your own way in your seats that God will speak. Say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, open my heart in your own way. Just talk to Jesus these next few moments. Thank you, God. Speak, Lord. Open our hearts in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. The title of this message is coming straight out of verse 4. In verse 4, he says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The title of this message is Work While It's Day. That's the title here. Because of what I get from that passage, Jesus is saying, we only really have so much time. We have to get it in. Come on, you ever been to like Six Flags Great America or some place like that? I mean, you guys in Ohio, it's, it's on Cedar Point. Is that in Ohio? Okay, cool. When I was a shorty, I visited there. What was it called? Cedar Point. Okay, I got it, I got it right. Okay, cool, cool. Okay, nice, nice. But you go to these amusement parks, especially as kids, you go there and you're there for like 10 hours. And the parents, I'm sure, they're like going nuts. Like this is like a 10 hour, or it feels like 10 hours, right, for the parents. And when you get there, I was a kid, we had to get it in. And so we got there at 2 in the afternoon and we left at like 10 o'clock in the evening. And as a kid, you're like, man, Six o'clock hits, seven o'clock hits. You're like, I haven't hit this roller coaster up. I haven't done this, I haven't done that. And you want to get the most out of your time. Come on, I talked to somebody this morning. You want to get it in because there's a finite time and there's a finite opportunity. And that's what I that's the sense that I get here. When Jesus is speaking, saying, We have a work to do. 
And there's only so much time. Come on, even the team here, you guys are here for a week. Yeah. And you're like, man, we got to get it in this next week. And I think that's a microcosm of what God is calling his people to, to walk in. That sense of urgency, that sense of mission, that sense of purpose. And, and there's a finite opportunity because there's a finite time. So I believe that God wants to start out this morning by speaking to us that those in the workplace, those on college campuses, those in ministry, those in high school, wherever you're at, don't look at your, your post and your position in life as an obligation or even as an occupation depending on where you work at. Think of it as an opportunity. There's an opportunity. And I believe that the hourglass, the proverbial hourglass has been turned upside down. Yeah. And there, the, the clock is ticking. Yeah. But God is ready to move. God is ready to do great things. And we see here in the text that God is doing some great things. We see a man who was healed of his blindness. I want to talk about four things. The right, having the right message when it comes to working while in the state. And then after this, we'll talk about the right mission the right mindset, and the right method. And so if you can just follow me here for a moment, I want to walk us through, and then I want us to respond and seek after God. The right message. It says that as he passed by, he saw a man that was what? Blind. From birth. He was blind from birth. Now, as I was studying this text, and if you study the text, and you begin to think about this man was blind from birth, if you think about it long enough, you can start to feel sorry for this, this gentleman. If we have any ounce of compassion in our hearts, you can't help but to ask yourself questions like, why was this man born like this? Was he cursed? What did his parents do for God to give them a blind child? And we begin to feel empathetic and sympathetic and all these things. But if you think further and deeper about it and think of it in a spiritual sense, we have more in common with this man than maybe you would see at first blush. See, we're born into a quandary as human beings. God has given us this deep-seated desire to know him. No matter where you're at this morning in your walk with God, God is drawing you to this place. Even if your parents say, you're going to go on this trip, and you're going to go to Madison, Wisconsin, do ministry, or you're here because you feel obligated to be here. But there is a sense of desire in your heart to want to know God, to connect with God. Yeah. Those we're going to be ministering to in our lives this coming week, wherever you're at, God has placed in every last one of us as human beings a desire to know him. But at the same time, we have a sin nature that's on autopilot to do the very things that separate us from God. That's the definition of moral depravity. We want to know God, but we have this thing in us that's drawing us continuously away from God. And so this man right here, he needed healing in the natural. And he was born blind in the natural. Just like him, we were born spiritually blind. Yes. We were born spiritually blind and crippled. He needed healing. Mankind needs redemption. And that's why we must always work well at this day. That's why we must make the most of every opportunity. I love what Jesus did. It says that he saw a man that was blind from birth. Jesus saw the need and he met the need. Because he loved God and he was God and he loved people. And that he went into action. And we talked about that earlier. I feel like there's a thing here about stepping out and letting your, your words and your, your compassion turn into action. And that's what we see here with Jesus. He recognized the need, and this man needed a miracle. Make no mistake about it. And we need to remember that when we talk about the right message, the gospel message brings about a miraculous work in the lives of those who need. Again, make no mistake about it. I'm talking about a miraculous work. If you have given your heart to Jesus at some point in time, and you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, and you've become born again, you are a living miracle. Yes. You're a living miracle. And we're going to get into this a little more, but I just want you to take that in, that this gospel message, it brings about miracles. And so when we're preaching it, we need to understand that it's, it works miracles. And we need to also understand that we are living miracles when it comes to us in the gospel in our lives. I want to pause here and break down a couple of different needs. There is a difference between a felt need and a real need. A felt need is a byproduct or a response to a real need. 
Felt needs tend to be more surfacy. Real needs are deeper seated in our lives, in our hearts, in our emotions, and in our spirits. For instance, as we're preaching the gospel, we must be reminded that some people, they feel they have a need for companionship. They, man, if I can just get that, that the right woman on my arm, I'll be right. Or the right husband. Or if I have the, the right um, relationships romantically, whatever the case might be, that's a felt need. And it feels so acute and it feels so real. But in reality, we have these felt needs for companionships in the, in the natural, humanly speaking, because there is a deeper, real need for relationship with Jesus, a relationship with God. And you find people, and this is somewhat of my testimony too, you find those who go from relationship to relationship to relationship because they're trying to scratch an itch that only God can scratch. That only the gospel can really meet and can really touch. You have those who might have a, a felt need or this really acute sense of a need for affirmation. They need to be told that they are, they're doing well or that they look good or that they're smart. This need for affirmation, which is not bad, it's human. It's something that's human nature. We want affirmation. But the real need that only God can meet is a need for being accepted and being told of who you are in Christ. Amen. And what your identity is according to the yes. Bible. Yes. That's why it is so important. We find many people, I see it all the time on college campuses, and you see wherever you go, people go from this identity to that identity, trying to find themselves because they're trying to, again, meet a real need by scratching a surface itch. So what's the deal with the gospel? Why do we preach the gospel? Because the gospel gets through all of that. The gospel touches that felt need, but it really meets that real need. And so when you're preaching the gospel, sometimes we make the mistake and we say, if you give your heart to Jesus, he's going to make your life easier. If you give your heart to Jesus, he's going to make your marriage better. If you give your heart to Jesus, he's going to make you richer. He's going to solve all of your problems. Now, don't get me wrong. Jesus meets all of those needs, but that should not be what we lead with when we preach the gospel. We share Jesus because people's souls are lost and because we need to be reconciled to God. And some people have a felt need to be reconciled to other human beings and to be, and there is there's this harmony in a relationship and you need to be forgiven or you need to give forgiveness. And that happens and reconciliation takes place. You're still feeling like, man, something is missing. The thing that is missing is that although you made peace with mankind, have you made peace with God? Yeah. The right message. And I want to lead with this. Because you notice what Jesus did. He saw a man that was blind from birth. Now, here's a spoiler. Okay, spoiler alert. He was healed of his blindness. You guys, if you were paying attention, that's, that, that's in the Bible. Jesus healed him. Okay, it happened. Jesus did what he does. Jesus, you would notice, he didn't come and he didn't give the man a walking stick. Now, if he had given the man a walking stick, would the man have been better off than what he was before Jesus showed up? Come on. Yes. yes. Right? He can get around better with a walking stick. But then, let's say if this, he had a walking stick, and someone comes with a service dog and say, you know what, sir? Give me that walking stick. I have something even better. A service dog who can lead you wherever you need to go. He can protect you. Somebody tries to do something they shouldn't do, etc. He's going to get rid of that walking stick. He's going to take that service dog. And let's say somebody else shows up and says, I have a personal assistant for you. Not a dog, but I have an actual human being who's going to be there with you 24-7. Is that better than a service dog? Amen. But that would have just been meeting felt need after felt need after felt need. He still would have been right. See, Jesus didn't come to help him get around in everyday life by just putting a Band-Aid on a shotgun wound. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we do sometimes when we preach the gospel and say, hey, if you accept Jesus, then this will go better and that will go better. But we're not dealing with the root issue, which is our sin and our need to be reconciled through the blood of Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, I'm going to heal you of this blindness. I'm going to go to the root. I'm going to deal with the real issue at hand. And I want us to start out with this because we need to know what we're dealing with when it comes to the gospel. We need to respect the gospel message because we're called to preach it. Amen? And the gospel message that we've been called to preach, it is life-changing 
from the root down to the fruit up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jesus came to bring true reconciliation. We need to preach the right message. The next thing we need to preach, the next thing we need to be on, should I say, is the right mission. The right mission. How many of us understand that God has called us on mission? Just by showing your hands. Come on, if you don't believe it, just raise your hand anyway and say, I know that's true, but I don't feel it, but I know it's true. Come on, God has called all of us to be missional. It says, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. It's the same passage that we went with on the first point. But get this. It says, he saw a man. I think that is so significant. Yeah. Why is that significant? Because we know about Jesus ministering to the masses. We know about Jesus preaching um, the Sermon on the Mount, ministering to the multitudes, feeding the 5,000. We know about what Jesus did when it comes to him reaching out and ministering to the masses. But mm -hmm. well, let us not forget about Jesus and blind Bartimaeus, Jesus and Nicodemus, Jesus and Zacchaeus, Jesus and the woman at the well. Jesus was all about ministering to the individual. And I think the right mission is ministering to the individual. I, you know, we're called to reach out to the college campuses. And we have over 500,000 college students in the city of Chicago. Yes, I get that. And yes, that is true. But the Lord just broke my heart. And he said, Todd, I'm not just calling you to reach out to UIC or Columbia College or Northwestern. I'm calling you to reach out to John. I'm calling you to reach out to Susie. I'm calling you to reach out to the individual. And as you're going about your days in school, as you're going about your days, even in the ministry, as you're going to work out at the gym, the Lord wants to open our eyes, and Lord, the Lord wants us to see the individual. The Lord is even challenging us, I believe, to stop praying only macro prayers. You know what I mean by macro prayers? We pray, God, do it in our city. Lord, do it in our schools. Lord, do it in Madison. Do it in Chicago. Do it in Cleveland. God is saying, yeah, pray those prayers, but say, Lord, don't just move in my city, but God, give me a heart for the one who works in the cubicle yes. next to me. Yes. Give me a heart for that young man who goes and works out with me. But God, you're sovereign over those on my basketball team, my baseball team, the cheerleading squad, those in the chess club with me. God, give me a heart for this person who's sitting to my left and sitting to my right. Jesus saw the individual. It says he saw a man who was hurting, who was broken, who was blind from birth. And may God open our eyes and have the mission and see those who are broken in our communities, those who are hurting, those who are lost. And when God opens our eyes, then we are on the right mission. I want to share a quick story about someone who saw the individual. We have a young lady who was in our ministry years ago. Her name was Jessica. Her name is Jessica, actually. She just got married. And um, her last name changed. Her first name stayed the same. And we actually um, had the honor, I had the honor of ministering at her, her, um, her wedding, actually, literally two weeks ago. Anyway, um, she was agnostic, meaning that she said, maybe there is a God, but um, there's no way of proving him. And she was fierce. Let me tell you, Jessica was fierce. Jessica, she went to Loyola University. She had a Catholic background. Um, and she was just disenfranchised with the church. And so she, she came in and she started coming to our small groups that we had on campus at the time. And she was attending and she was that one who asked questions. Come on, you ever had those Bible studies where nobody likes those cricket Bible studies? Where you're teaching, any questions anybody? People are just looking at you. Like crickets, crickets, crickets. Okay, well move on to the next one then. No, not with Jessica. Jessica, I have a question. And she was the type that had a question. When you gave an answer, that led to three more questions. That led to three more questions. And you have to say after a while, Jessica, let's talk after small group. <laughs> and this is like, we're going to do some extended private sessions. I had many of those with Jessica. By the grace of God, by the end of her freshman year, Jessica came to faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. God really just came to correct her, and she got saved, saved. And God really touched her life. And God, my wife um, discipled her, and God's done a great work in her life. Well, a couple of summers ago, Jessica was in downtown Chicago. You talk about seeing an individual. There's thousands of people in downtown Chicago in the heart of the summer. She's walking around. She said, God, she prayed this prayer. God, I want you to lead me to somebody that I can preach the gospel to. Just leave it to one person. There's all kinds of stimuli. There's all kinds of people with things and places. But she said, God, show me the individual. 
And after a while, the Lord pointed out a young lady who was standing outside. She had a hijab on her head. And she looked like somebody from, uh, Middle East, from the Middle East. And Jessica's like, God, I think this is the one. So she steps out. She goes up to this young lady. She says, hi. And the young lady says, hi. It was very awkward. And, and um, the first question the young lady asked Jessica, she says, are you a Christian? Yeah. Jessica's like, yes. Are you a Muslim? She said, yes. Within five minutes, they had exchanged numbers, exchanged information. And they said, let's stay in touch. Over the next uh, several weeks, they began to connect several times a week and to meet up. Now, Jessica's heart was to lead this young lady to Jesus and share the gospel. This young lady's heart was to lead <laughs> Jessica to, to Allah. <laughs> and it was like an evangelism face-off, let me tell you. And they began to meet, and Jessica, she wasn't, the, the young lady's name was Dina. Dina wasn't ready for what Jessica was bringing to the table, which was the gospel. And she began to preach the right message to the right person, the right mission. And as she's sharing the gospel, this young lady was like blown away because she said she's from Saudi Arabia. She said, this is not what I was raised to believe. Wait a minute here. But she says, I know something that's true about Islam that has never been debated, that has never been defunct. I know that this is true. And Jessica sent her to a Muslim apologist website. So the young lady went to this website, and it's a Christian who shares about the gospel in the context of Islam to get Muslims to come to the faith. And this young lady is looking at this website, and this one pet doctrine that she knew was true of Islam was totally just wiped out by what the man was sharing, which was true. And so she's really blown away now. She's like, now I'm in a crisis. I'm in an identity crisis. I'm in a cultural crisis. I'm in all types of crises because my whole world has been turned upside down. She began to call, count the cost up about the gospel. Weeks went by, and the young lady began to attend a prayer meeting that we had that summer with Jessica. And as she's at these prayer meetings, she feels the presence of God. And she tells Jessica, she says, I'm beginning to feel something about this Jesus that I've never felt in my entire life about God at all. So I'm sharing these details so you guys can really get the meats and potatoes of what God has done in this young lady's life. She comes to a Bible study that someone was, it was a local church that was having a Bible study. She happened to come on the day that they had a guy who was a Muslim apologist yeah. preaching at the Bible study. He, he was sharing about the gospel. He shared the story about when Jesus spoke to the storm. He said, peace, be still. Yeah. And she said, when she heard peace, be still. She felt peace in her life that she had never felt before. Wow. Even though she comes from the faith that is known as Islam, which is known as the, the faith of peace. Yeah. She, wow. she had never truly experienced peace. Well, Ramadan shows up. This is, we're talking months that it's going by. Ramadan shows up. And so she, she's honoring that because culturally she still identifies as a Muslim. So she takes that time and she fasts during the month of Ramadan. And she was here for an advanced medical degree. So she would go to class in the mornings, and she wouldn't eat. So by the time she got home, she was weak. And so she wasn't able to really hang out with Jessica for, we're talking like several weeks. But they would text back and forth, text back and forth. And we were praying for this young lady. Well, the young lady, Jessica, she sent Jessica a text. This is early August, a couple of summers ago. She says, hey, how are you doing, sister? And Jessica says, and they had this relationship with Jessica to tell her what she did. She said, you know I love you, but I can't call you sister because you're not a Christian. And she says, well, actually, I pray and I ask Jesus into my yeah. heart. Yes. 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 She got radically saved. She said, if, and I, I, I met up with this young lady after she got saved. I'm like, you tell me the story. And she said, I know that when my family finds out, they're going to try to kill me. She said, but I love Jesus too much, and I know what the truth is, and I'm not turning back. She's now married to a man of God. She's now attending a local church. This young lady is truly radically that said, let me show you a picture. Next slide. This is Jessica on, the, on, the, on my left, and that's Dina on the right. Next slide. This was at her baptism service. I baptized her several, a couple years ago. Let me tell you, God is at work. Come on, can we give the Lord a hand back to Why did this happen? Because someone preached the right message on the right mission. 
She saw the individual. She was there in downtown. She went, what, if, what would happen if God gave all of us that heart? Just, just even once a summer. How about that? Just once a summer. That the Lord would lead us to that individual and give us the boldness to step out. Sometimes we know God's leading us, but we just don't step out. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Nah, that ain't God. Nah, nah. No, it's, it's, it's probably God. <laughs> but we also need the right mindset. Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but, everybody say but, but. that the works of God might be displayed in him. I love this because this is Jesus' response to the question that the disciples asked. And if you guys recall, what was the question that the disciples asked? They said, who sinned? This man or his parents and he was born blind. Now I like to, you know how they say there are no dumb questions, right? And there really aren't except half of this question. Because he says, who sinned? I understand he said maybe his parents sinned. Um, they could have been, they could have just been living an abusive, reckless lifestyle where something happened um, in the prenatal um, process where this man was born blind. Things can happen physically to cause someone to be born blind. But he said, they said that this man sinned that he was born blind. Like, what could he have done in the womb? Like, did he kick too hard or something? You know? It's just like, you think, like, just, I, I'm sorry, when I read the Bible, I like to think critically and just like let my imagination on the Bible. God has a sense of humor, so I try to, you know. Someone told me before, they say, if you think the Bible is boring, the Bible's not boring, you are. <laughs> right? It just means that the, the Word of God is alive and it's I, I love reading the Word of God. Woke up this morning by the grace of God, open up the Word. I do that every day because the Word of God is alive. Yes. Anyway, that's what they asked Jesus. And Jesus' response was, it was not this man so his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed. And why did they ask this question? <laughs> because they were in the midst of a crisis. Mm -hmm. What's the crisis? The man was blind. That's a crisis. He was born blind. That's a crisis. And let me just give you a definition of what a crisis is. I looked it up. And a crisis is an unstable or a crucial time or state of affairs in which a decisive change is impending. Especially one with the distinct possibility of a highly undesirable outcome. The turning point for better or worse in an acute disease or fever. The decisive moment as in a literary plot. So there's a few definitions there of a crisis. You guys all get what a crisis is, right? You're like, I don't need to the definition of what a crisis is. Let me tell you what I'm going through right now. You know what a crisis is, right? It's when the heat is on, like, man, things, this is not good. This is really not good. It can go really bad at any moment. Where Jesus shows up in the midst of crises. Speaking of a crisis, let me tell you about one. Several years ago, Chicago got hit with one of its notorious uh, winter storms. And I remember I was, um, this is, yeah, there we go, there we go. We were, um, before we even get to that picture, let me let me just share a quick story here. But I was I was actually um, going to meet up with a friend on the south side of the city, and he was working. His name is Jorge um, um, Alavelo. He's from El Salvador. Good friend of mine. He's on staff with us. He works at San Xavier University. So we get to meet up and talk about Kyle. I'm saying, bro, you sure you want to come? There's a storm coming. I said, bro, you're from El Salvador. I'm from Chicago. For you, a few inches of snow means that it's a disaster. For me, I can do it. It's no big deal. It's like, bro, are you sure? Are you? I'm like, I'm wrong. Positive. I get this. So we meet up. We finish meeting up. He said, bro, you better get going because the snow is coming. Like, okay, whatever. So I'm driving. And the first five minutes, the snow begins to come. And it's coming pretty fast. Like, bro, you know, no biggie. The next five minutes, it comes even faster. The next five minutes, faster and faster. Well, what it take it be? 35 minutes, as far as getting back to where I needed to be, took me an hour and 50 minutes. Because snow would get it. We can put it up. Thanks, William. This right here, let's keep that for a second. Go back. This is Lakeshore Drive. Anybody ever driven down Lakeshore Drive before? This is the most beautiful um, drive in the city of Chicago. In the city of Chicago, this is the most scenic drive. They don't even allow trucks on it because it mars the beauty of the, it shows you the skyline, the whole nine. You should drive down Lakeshore Drive if you ever come to Chicago, right? Well, this is what it usually looks like. Now, this was Lake, This is Lakeshore Drive, the day that Snowmageddon hit. Now, it's what it was called, it was called Snowmageddon. 
Good. If you can do Google slow and get it, I guarantee you. You don't have to do it now. You gotta listen to the word. But if you Google slow and get it, let me tell you, you're going, it was it was so crazy. Lakeshore Drive turned into a parking lot. Yeah. It was so bad. If you look up in the bottom right corner, that's a bus. That's a CTA bus. It couldn't even go any further. It came so fast that people abandoned their cars for days. Oh my for God. days. It was so now this is Chicago. It was so bad that the Chicago public school system shut down. Yeah. Now, if you don't think about Chicago public school, they don't shut down for anything. Come on, somebody. They don't shut down for anything. I'm like, man, what was that when I was in school? They didn't shut down. Like, man, it's a, it's a, <laughs> it got really bad. At this time, they were the, the mayor of the longtime mayor, Richard Daly, was actually had already said he was resigning and he was done with this time as mayor. So people were vying for this mayoral uh, position. Now, when politics get involved, you know what things can get really messy. So people started pointing fingers. They started saying, if the mayor had shut down Lakeshore Drive, this wouldn't have happened. What could he have done about this? Snowmageddon was coming, like it or not. They received ample warning, but everybody in Chicago was thinking like, this guy right here, always just nothing but, because we hear it all the time. You know, they say meteorologists, it's the only job where you can lie every day and get it wrong and still keep your job the next day. You know? And, and let me tell you, but it came, and it came with, with, with fierceness. And so, it was a crisis. And when there's a crisis, people ask questions. And that's what was happening in this situation. Why did this happen? Who allowed this to happen? Why did they shut down the roads? And this crisis right here, the disciples are asking, who caused this to happen? Did he sin? Did his parents sin? That made this come to pass? Well, listen to the response of Jesus. If we go back to the um, text. Jesus said, it was neither that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. In a crisis, there are always questions begging to be asked and begging to be answered. The disciples asked why this crisis had taken place. Jesus answered their question with an unexpected response. His disciples and he both saw the same situation, but from two different perspectives. I want you guys to get this. His answer gives us insight into their limited human perspective and into his God perspectives. When they asked, the disciples were concerned about the cause of the Christ. Everybody say the cause. The cause. What was the cause? When Jesus answered, he chose to focus on the purpose of the crisis. Get that. See, when we're going out on ministry, even this week when you're ministering, you're going to be around those who are in the midst of crises. You're going to come across those who are um, feeling economically um, broke. They're, you're going to come across those who are depressed, those who may have just lost a loved one, those who just had a relationship break off. Maybe you have it every day in high schools and on college campuses, those who are cutting themselves, those who have secret identity issues with their sexuality. We're talking about crises. And as believers, we cannot come into these situations and just think of what caused this to happen and begin to point the fingers at people. We need to point the finger at God yeah. and say, God, what's the purpose? How can you be glorified for this? Jesus said this was done for the glory of God. And faith sees opportunities in the midst of crises. And I want to ask you that this morning, before we get a chance to pray, in the midst of the crises that you have in your lives, that you come across when you're ministering, do you see the cause or do you see the purpose? Are you seeing them with eyes of faith? Because when you see them with eyes of faith, the Lord shows there's an opportunity here to move and to do something great. I see in the city of Chicago, people are getting shot left and right, primarily in two neighborhoods. We need to pray for the neighborhoods of Inglewood and the Austin neighborhoods. It's not all across the city of Chicago. But let me tell you, whether you're getting shot and there's gang activities and drug activities, or you're a white-collar worker who doesn't need God, so to speak, and you're cheating on your wife, you're still broken. You still need Jesus. Yeah. And so we see all of these different crises, but do we see opportunities? In the natural, what is happening is we have those who are walking away from the faith. We have those who don't want anything to do with God. We have those who, when it comes to Christian values, they're shedding down the very notion of God and living like Christians in this day and age. But, everybody say but. But God wants to be glorified. And God will be glorified when his church is on mission and they walk into this place and they say there's a purpose here. When I was on campus at Southern Illinois University, 
There was an RA by the name of Chris McGlory. Chris McGlory, I'm sorry, he was actually the head resident. He was the head of RAs. There was a young man there from the city of Chicago who was doing drugs, who was selling drugs, who was about to get expelled from school, and then Chris McGlory shows up and he asked this young man, he says, I gotta kick you out because you've been, you violated the conduct code on campus with your drug use and your drug distribution. I have to send you back to Chicago because you violated the conduct code seven times already. I have to send you on a one-way train back to Chicago. He asked this young man, do you want to change? Do you want to stop smoking weed? Do you want to stop selling drugs? Do you want to have your life changed? This young man said, yes. Chris Boy prayed for that young man, and he says, I'm a Christian, and God is telling me not to kick you out, but to pray for you. Because Chris Boy, there was a crisis, but he saw opportunity. He prayed for that young man. That young man got saved a month later, became good friends with Chris McGlory, and is now sharing the gospel with you today by the grace of God. I was that young man who was in a crisis, and someone prayed for me in the midst of my dark lifestyle. How many Todd Lucases, if you will, are you coming across every day? We don't know until we have eyes of faith to be led by the Spirit to obey God in the midst of a crisis. Amen? The final point I want to make, the right method. The right method. How do I do mission? How do I? I, I don't know the Bible like that, Todd. I can't preach the Bible. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not a pastor. I'm not called to be a pastor. So how can I make a difference? How can I be on mission? It says that having said these things, he stood on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam which means sent. So he went and watched and came back seen. Can we ask somebody to come play on the keys if that's okay? Somebody play something soft as we get ready to close. Thank you. Um, it says, having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva, then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. Now Jesus, Jesus, is, he, he's done many miracles in many different ways, right? We have the examples in Scripture where Jesus prayed for a man and then he says, what do you see now? And the man looks up and says, I see people, they look like trees. Yeah. Then Jesus prayed for him again. He says, what do you see now? He says, oh, I can see clearly. So we see Jesus pray for someone. They don't get healed right away, but the healing process takes place. He prays for them again, then the healing takes place. We see times where Jesus says, go, the word has been spoken. Your servant has been healed. They go back. And it was just by the word that he spoke, without laying hands on him, the person was healed. Jesus did many miracles, many ways. But I must say, this is the most disgusting of all the miracles. Let's be honest, people. He spits. It's like, hey, I need prayer. And he spits. But can you imagine coming to the altar and then getting, getting prayer? Come on, come on, um, Pastor Knight. You know, can you imagine, Pastor, I need prayer, Pastor Knight. And he spits. I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to brother so-and-so. You can stay over there, okay? No, just say the word, Pastor <laughs> But I say that with all reference and due respect to the scriptures when I say it was disgusting. I'm being funny here. But it's interesting. And what I see happening here is not just someone spitting and making mud and putting it on the guy's face, even though that is what's happening. I see an application that I think relates to all of us here. Jesus used what was at his disposal to bring about a miracle, to bring about change, to be one mission. And you might be here this morning and you're thinking, I have these resources, I have this skill set, I have this experience, the good, the bad, the ugly of all of it. But God can't really use that. God doesn't hold us accountable to what we don't have. He holds us accountable to what is at our disposal. He's saying, use what you do have. Hey, I don't have to have a college degree. Use what you do have. I don't want the Bible left to the front and back. Use what you do have. Get disciple. Get into the Word. But God is there. God leaves no space for excuses when it comes to being on mission. So when we talk about the methods, maybe you expected like a practical one, two, three step, this is what you do. Yes, there's a time for that, and there's a place for that. But we want to get at the heart of the matter. The heart is that God has uniquely equipped every last one of us. He wants to use what is our, what's at our disposal. I grew up in the housing projects in the city of Chicago, and we were very poor. Some people like to say we were poor. We couldn't afford the last O and R. We were that poor. We were broke. And even as a poor family and as poor kids, and I don't think this has changed over time, 
We didn't have a lot of resources, but we were still picking and choosing. That's how kids can be. And you know one thing I didn't like as a kid? Leftovers. I did not like leftovers. <laughs> Somebody said amen. <"Hey>, <laughs> The older you get, you appreciate leftovers more. Come on. And we would come in, we'd be playing outside. My grandmother's place was like the hub. We had a big family. We would all come in. My cousins, we'd have fun outside, come in, and we are like, hey, is there anything to eat? My grandmother said, the fridge is packed. And we would go open the fridge, all we saw was leftovers. Close the fridge. And she's like, did you get anything? No, there was nothing in there. What do you mean there was nothing in there? It was just leftovers. And we were so chill, like our stomachs would be growling, but we didn't want to go in and get any leftovers. Well, I had a cousin named, I have a cousin, his name is Bob, we call him Big Bob. And the, the emphasis on Big, he was country Big. <laughs> big Bob wasn't as picky and choosy. And he would go in, and we would go and see nothing in the fridge, essentially. But he would go in, and he would like whip some stuff together, and we'd be in there like hungry, like, oh man, we need to eat something. We'd walk in the kitchen. And Bobby has like a feast that's laid out. Like, what did you get that from? I got it from the fridge. Like, how did you do that? Right? And I'm saying, this is the true story. Like, to this day, Bob has never seen a meal that he turned down. And what I'm getting at is that he would have the stuff laid out because he looked in the fridge and he didn't see leftovers. He saw a meal. And I think sometimes we look at our lives, we think of what we don't have, what we've been through the brokenness in our past, our family, um, um, whatever, the legacy and, and our pedigree, we're like, man, we don't have it. And we say, these are leftovers, we can't use it. I believe God wants to speak to us. Use what's at your disposal. Don't look in the proverbial fridge and say, no, those are leftovers. God's going to open it up. I want to use that. I want to use that to feed the masses. I want to use that to change lives. I want to use what you have to bring about life change, you know, open the eyes of the blind. And I believe that God will speak to us specifically about something today, our stories. Use your stories. And maybe some of you here, there are parts of your story that you are afraid to share because of shame. There are parts of your past that you don't want to tell people about, even though God has brought freedom, even though God has breathed upon that, you've kept it to yourself. God is like, it's time to let it out. It's time to tell others. Because when we're vulnerable, others become vulnerable. That's right. They're like, oh, God's done it. Oh, he can do that in my life as well. But we're sitting on that gift. You know what someone, I heard someone preach recently, when it comes to our testimonies and our stories, God has the intellectual property rights to our testimonies, not us. It's God's story. We're just the best ones. So in essence, it's God's, we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of our testimony. It's obedience. Share your story. As we get ready to pray, there's a young lady I want to talk about. Her name is Mamie. Her name is Manuela, but she goes by Mamie. She's from France, was raised in Paris, France. She came to the city of Chicago because she got a scholarship to play basketball at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She came here, got connected to our ministry because as an international student, she's looking for a place to connect. She got connected to our ministry. She got radically saved. God changed her life. She, get, she got discipled by my wife. In fact, they're still connecting on a very um, frequent basis. She's one of our student leaders to this day. She got saved. Was got, she got baptized. At her baptism service, she invited her, um, her, her um, teammates, and she invited her coaches as well. Amen. And she shared her testimony on how she met Jesus. She was just using what she had at her disposal. She graduates with her degree in accounting, and she... Um, needs a job after graduation because she wants to pursue grad school. So she gets accepted into the graduate program for accounting. She gets accepted and she needs a job. So she goes, she's looking for assistantships and fellowships and all different types of jobs, opportunities. Door closed, one after the next, after the next. So she says, hey, let me go back to my coach and see if I can do something with the basketball team. She walks into the office of the coach. He says, hey, coach. I need a, a job and you have anything I can do on the team. And the coach basically says, no, I'm sorry, I don't have anything. And so she leaves. And the Holy Spirit told her to go back. She goes back the next day and talks to the coach again. The coach says, actually, I do have a job for you. Okay, what happened in the last 24 hours? We don't know. But she came back and the coach says, um, I want to make you director of women's basketball operations. 
That's a big, big deal. She's like, whoa. Manny got her own office with her nameplate, and she's like super official with all kinds of influence that God had given her. She says, God, I want you to use this for your glory. I don't know how, but I want you to use it. A couple of months later, crises begin to arise on the basketball team. And the coach comes to Manny. And we were praying that God would use this post that God has given Manny for his glory. The coach comes to her. She says, you know that group that you were part of? It's like, yeah, you know the one that baptized you? I'm like, yeah. He's like, um, she alpha? I'm like, no, it's Kai alpha, you know? He's like, yeah. She says, um, you know, um, we have some issues on our basketball team. Do you think that the Kai Alpha group can mentor our, our, our basketball players? Yeah. And he's like, well, let me pray about that. No, for sure. <laughs> God opened the door where our ministry began to be able to minister with like wide open doors to the basketball team. My wife became one of the, um, the mentors. And this is great. She's um, connected with some girls who've been coming to our March for Worship meetings the whole night. God is radically using Manny because Manny said, God, this is all I have, but I'll give it to you and I want you to use it. What has God given you? What do you have? And I want us to pray. And I, we've been going for a while here, so if you wouldn't mind standing with me, if you can stand. I have one last quote. Do we have it up about procrastination? Oh, I love this. Don't let fear cause you to procrastinate on the things that God prioritizes. Get that in your spirits. Don't let fear creep in. I just want to open this altar. We believe here in this ministry, I know they believe in us responding to the word of God. And I want, let's kick off this week. This is not just a, a new week for